So these radishes were um, one of those little seed kits that you get where they put the seeds in the strips of uh, paper. And then you plant the strips. So one strip was back there. And then there was another strip. And then there's another strip. The uh, carrots never came up. Uh, I'm not sure if the seeds were bad or what, what the situation was with that. Uh, the soil is peat. It's a peat potting soil mix. So it's... Um, it is a non-loom, non-clumping... Partially clumping. Very light soil. <clears throat> I've had good luck with growing a lot of different things in this year. It's uh, it's been pretty hot, <clears throat> and you can see the heat because the uh, potatoes are moving away from the sun. So you see that little spot right there where that sunlight is, and you notice that plant's kind of laying down, not looking all that good. But then the rest of the plant's over here in the shade. Now I see these tags all the time and says plant in full sunlight, but when I put them in full sunlight, as soon as the Missouri sun hits them, they're dead. <laughs> you know, that's, that's an interesting thing. You know, plant in full sunlight in the spring and make sure it's not growing in the summer is what they should put on there. So what I do is I come out here and I'll check my uh, tomatoes and I'll, I'll feel around on the leaves and then I'll look around on the stalks. I'll look for something that's been eating on it. Now this, uh, you see the hair on these tomatoes. Of course, they're not producing a scent just yet. Uh, they won't produce a scent till they start attracting human beings to their uh, fruit. Uh, which is an interesting thing because you're walking around, you, you, you brush up against the tomato, you smell it, and of course the tomato is red, so the red is already attracting you to it. And uh, it releases a scent, and that makes you stop and get closer to the tomato plant. Now, this one, this one right here I was having issues with, uh, and if you see where my finger was, uh, before I put a tarp on it, it was right about here, uh, but it seems to be doing better uh, And what I mean by the uh, the health of the plant um, I'll crawl up underneath here And if you look at the hair that's on this tomato plant as the indicator Which you're not gonna be able to see because I don't have enough light Okay, we're we getting hair So if you see the fuzz on that, and you see how they're spread further apart and they're not not closely compacted, um, that hair can tell you the health of the tomato plant. You see the leaves; leaves are doing all right, but they're kind of they're kind of fat. They're not really as pointy uh, as these right here. You see the change in the leaves right here after I put the tarp on it. So this is all new growth, and you see how that looks like a tomato plant. But when we get down here, this doesn't quite look like a tomato plant. We had some uh, nice growth right here over to this side, but everything over here uh, didn't do all that well because this part of the garden gets pretty hot. And that squash over in the corner over there is uh, doing better now that the tarp was put up. That squash is doing better, and you see how that one right there is drooping, but that one's standing up and that one's standing up. So this whole... Uh, <clears throat> full sun uh, thing for a lot of the vegetables uh, sometimes isn't uh, isn't the greatest of ideas uh, especially in Missouri because it, uh, like I said Missouri Missouri gets hot <laughs> it gets hot and it gets dry here you know I've actually compared Missouri's weather as in the ambient outside temperatures uh, similar to that of the desert sometimes it gets pretty dry here our humidity can drop down pretty low um, not quite as dry as the desert, but there is dry heat, and dry heat will wick differently. Uh, moist heat, some people say moist heat is worse than dry heat. And there's a nice wax coating on those, so that's good. So here's the, here's the Kairobi. Um, one of them split, so I'm going to have two on that. This one's already starting to develop a, a Kairobi bulb.
those are all starting to develop bulbs. My peppers, uh, that's an ornamental. And then I have bell peppers. I haven't gone to flower just yet. These tomatoes are looking pretty good. Of course, this one's wanting to tuck up underneath here. So just to, to show you if the plant's going to prefer full sun or if it prefers shade or a type of shade. But then you see the, you see how much hair that's on that right there. And you see how it's not quite thinned out, but it looks nice and healthy. And how everything is, how everything is furry. And then we look down here at this younger plant and we see we see how that's furry so that's that's a good indication to tell how healthy your tomato plants are i've got uh got tomatoes already very small ones and those are the lower branches so i've got three three tomatoes being grown on that one already and i'm not seeing anything on this just yet I'll walk back up here and take a look at these other tomato plants. I don't think I'll have anything developing on that just yet. So we don't have any tomatoes developing just yet. Now, Emmy, if you're watching this, I did put my tomatoes out. I think, uh, depending on your video, I think there was probably about a week uh, to a couple of days discretion uh, between your planting and my planting. And of course your climate uh, north is a bit different uh, than mine. Uh, my temperatures I think might be a bit hotter. Uh, I think you guys get more humidity up north uh, with a bit cooler temperatures. So um, you probably wouldn't have to deal with this sort of tarp thing, but this part of the garden is pretty hot. So if you see that space right there, the sun comes out of that pretty early and then it's sort of on top of this tarp. And this, this edge of the garden is, is where my hot spot is uh, which is located right here so this is the the hottest part of the garden and I've tarped a lot of things so I need to start training that one uh, that over there is looking pretty good and as you see these are kind of droopy and they're droopy because of the Sun so plant in full Sun isn't necessarily always the the best uh, course of action uh, in my opinion um these are in full sun they're looking like they're doing all right but over here in the shaded you notice how they're flattening out and looking better but in in the direct sun uh where my arm is right here i can actually feel the the, the tingle from the sun and right now my body is experiencing uh the uh, pores are opening of my skin <clears throat> and they're getting ready to sweat by standing right here you know, this, this is a very very hot spot in the garden but then whenever I walk over here <coughs> over here by the peppers I'm still feeling a lot of that heat over there but whenever I get over here closer to the Kairobi and the tomatoes uh, the temperature actually sort of changes ever so slightly but the Sun the Sun is directly above and to the left yes I have dirty fingernails because I've been in my garden uh, but the garden is doing good the potatoes are doing all right uh, I'm not gonna have any tubers on this uh, and I probably won't be touching bases with pulling anything out of here until this fall so after these all die out then you can go in there and dig around um, it's always good to kind of mark things and label things uh, depending on how big your potato garden is but my grandfather grew, I think, roughly about an acre. He had a pretty good plot of potatoes, and uh, those potatoes lasted his family uh, through the winter. Of course, uh, my mother's side uh, was very large. Um, <clears throat> but is it an interesting thing how that see that sun ray down in there is hitting that plant and you notice how that plants kind of going that way so planting in direct sunlight I would say is not going to yield what you want to yield uh, there is uh, how can I say when you plant fields of this stuff you need to get sun tolerance so you need to get a pretty good strain a pretty good uh, seed uh, in order to put these out directly in the Sun of course uh, Illinois is in Minnesota but more Minnesota of course I got a stink bug 
Minnesota's temperatures are a bit different. So the temperatures I have here um, in regards to the sun, I actually have to put tarps on some plants because they'll dry up and they'll die out in Missouri sun. Uh, some of them are a bit more tolerant. Of course, this is broccoli. Broccoli is usually planted early. Uh, we had some late frosts and things like that. And when the temperatures get up to 70 degrees, broccoli naturally goes into a seed. So, you know, you could look at this and say, I'm gonna, I should go ahead and harvest that broccoli, uh, but it's, it's still doing pretty good. And if I have to, you know, I'll, I'll go get a tarp and stake out another tarp here. I mean, there's several tarps on the property for the wood pile that's over there because, you know, poor people have to burn wood <laughs> in order to survive. So ladies and gentlemen, if you stop to think about it, would you pay, rather pay $300 a winter for your heating bill or would you rather pay $1,500 for your heating bill in the winter? So this is a little walk through the garden, nothing too big. Uh, some smart ass uh, comments and some disrespectful things towards chickens that I would love to remark on. But uh, the tomatoes are doing good. Uh, we'll do a backup shot. Of course, yeah, I got the buckets. And the reason why I got the buckets there is a reminder that there are chicken parts that were, uh, how can I say, burned and put in there. So as you can see, the, um, the incinerating of the, the chicken parts didn't necessarily, uh, chicken remains, didn't cause any issues with uh, the plants growing in the area. And one plant actually has, uh, how can I say, uh, excelled from it. But this is a distance from my garden. This is a very small garden. Uh, the tomatoes, I may end up with possibly a bushel of tomatoes, maybe half a bushel of tomatoes. I might end up with an entire case of canned tomatoes. The Kairovi, one, two, three, four, five. There's five of them because of the fact that I have a double one there. Of course, they're all putting bulbs on right now. So the broccoli probably won't last very long. I'll cut it and let it grow. And then the bell peppers, I won't see them till late. Uh, the bell peppers usually do pretty good in that spot. Of course, I've had uh, cabbage here, and I've had cabbage here. The cabbage here didn't do all that well. The tomatoes did excellent over here. I literally had from here over was nothing but tomatoes. So this is uh, this garden, and then I have another one, which are the green beans and the tomatillos that are out in the sun. We'll, uh, we'll hop on over there and take a look at that. So here's my tomatillos, which are these, and I've been uh, removing grass here, and of course it doesn't help when the dog likes to walk through here. The onion has died, so transplanting that onion didn't do all that well, so I'll keep an eye on that next year to see if that comes back up. I actually have some tubers in my garden, um, parsnips actually, that did start growing. I did not point them out, but I did point the camera at them. Uh, this is another row of tomatillos. I'm not quite 100% sure how big that one little bitty plant's going to get, but uh, I'm sure they'll uh, dominate and thin each other out. These are the green beans. And yet again, I another purchased package of corn uh, that was sowed into the ground and the seeds did not germinate. Um, this packet of beans did not germinate. This pack of beans did germinate, and that pack of beans did germinate. They're already starting to vine out. Of course, I've got their little cage here, so eventually they'll be on each other and up against this. If I have to, I'll take something and run right down the middle of them. <clears throat> Bees are doing good, and like I said, unfortunately, there's uh, there's chemicals in those in the wax um, that. Uh, I know my intestines aren't going to be able to handle. Of course, I've got I've got some issues with the internals because of a lot of the bullshit that I've had to put in my body, and a lot of the stupidity that I put into my body. Uh, so, you know, I have to be careful about pesticides, herbicides. Herbicides are really bad. Uh, herbicides and pesticides can actually burn your intestines, and the herbicides and pesticides can be seen in your skin. Uh, this uh, this is what it looks like. And I have quite a few of them. So that's a pain reliever. There's a pain reliever. There's a pain reliever. So I've got a little bit of backup here in case the world turns crazy. Um, I'm not sure how well that's going to work for a long term. Uh, to my understanding, it's not good to use this plant for long term uh, treatment. But um, with some studies, I imagine we can probably come up with uh, a pretty decent, how can I say, use or method for use and of course we have THC nowadays uh, unfortunately this plant right here can cause respiratory uh, issues uh, so you know if you um, how can I say 
do too much of this or if it's too strong. I wouldn't advise any type of full strength with this with the gums of children. Um, this plant will make you stop and take a couple deep breaths. Uh, I have seen children do this. Uh, I myself did not take those real deep breaths until I was, uh, how can I say, until I was actually experimenting with this to see how it worked as a long-term um, pain medication. I, I got kind of spooked out because I found myself uh, sort of gasping every now and then taking a real heavy deep breath um, and breathing kind of shallow. I think what it was was I was breathing shallow um, because this stuff will numb you. Um, similarities to pharmaceuticals, um, Novocaine, not lidocaine, Novocaine, and if you've ever experienced the topical Novocaines, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is my crops for the year. Uh, there's a possibility that if you see the dirt... And you see how dry it is out here. It gets worse and you see the grass is starting to turn brown. Uh, some of the first signs of the summer. Darth is going to be, uh, the moss is going to die. And you see that moss is, is not doing all that well. Uh, you look at the yard, you can see the browning of the yard. Of course, we haven't had rain here in uh, a couple days. And the grasses uh, seem to do pretty decently because they all go to seed in the heat so they'll disperse their seeds uh, we are uh, stepping forward into what some beekeepers call a darth and the darth doesn't really get serious until uh, you stop seeing flowers when the flowers start dying from the heat then uh, that's where the darth takes place so there's some uh, pretty interesting plants in this world and there's some pretty interesting look-alikes of these plants like for instance this right here this is actually considered a hemp uh, back when they tried to eradicate uh, all of the hemp plants, uh, they actually, I think, I think it was a chemical or, I don't know how they did it, but uh, they wanted to stop the growth of marijuana and hemp altogether. Of course, this country was a huge hemp producer. I don't understand why, why anybody would want to do that to their own crop other than the fact that they're making way for another crop or they wanted to stop somebody's business. So that could have been a big hostile takeover. Uh, where one country or one company or somebody decided to put a chemical out to um, sterilize these plants because they say that they can't reproduce on their own, uh, but they have seed pods on them, as you can see. But that's a, that's a wild form. Uh, it almost has the same structure. Leaf structure looks a bit different. I think the chemical composition of this plant is different, or maybe different, or this is a possibility that this is a subspecies male. Um, the flowers are all in the wrong place, but the seed pods are in the right place. So if you look at the buds, this is what the buds would look like, but the buds aren't buds, they are actual flowers. Uh, so I would say do some research on that. The, uh, the wonderful plant that my honeybees use is doing exceptional this year. So this is sumac not poison sumac this is sumac this was a trade item uh, they actually uh, harvested this and shipped it over to foreign countries as a spice so the spice trade here in the United States uh, this was on the ships and if you see that big bush right there that's all sumac uh, also deer consume sumac uh, this is Queen Anne's Lace. Uh, this root is beneficial. Uh, there are parts of this plant that have other beneficiaries to it. Uh, some people call this ragweed. And there are people that actually go and spend $20 on a bottle of poison just to get rid of these things. And not knowing that the roots of these plants can help you. So I'm not sure if everybody has seen a cacti uh, in Missouri, but there's a cactus. And there's a cactus flower. Here in Missouri, we do have cacti that are here, uh, as well as cactus in the south. Of course, there's flowers blooming in the background, and chickens just being completely stupid. <laughs> so what's what's happening here is what a rooster will do is a rooster will go into a spot or a location, and he'll pick that location for his hen, and they'll he'll go in there and he'll start crowing, and his crowing will bring out anything that's in there so he will put himself out there and use himself as bait 
once they discover that there's nothing there, then they will go over to an area and they will just throw a complete fit, like what you're hearing today. So what they're doing is they're causing a distraction and they're, 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 all of the predators that are there are going to be paying attention to the rooster and not the hen. And the hen is settling down into a spot to nest naturally uh, in the yard somewhere. So the roosters are throwing a fit, as it's called. But what they're doing is they're bringing attention to themselves. The uh, blackberries... As you can see, this one has dried up and died. Um, sometimes because of Missouri and because of the way Missouri does things, but we have, uh, we have another plant that just died and is dying, but it's a cover vine. So it went to flower and it killed that plant when it went to flower. You see it back there? The honeysuckle is uh, wrapped up around the berry bush or the berry plant and it's dying off. Or it could have been because of drift. So, paying attention to your plants and looking at looking at what's going on as we go around the other side of the garden, we, we start to see there's burning in the plant. And it's not really that hot because there's a non-berry producer here, and then there's a berry producer here that is dead. And there's another one that's dead. There's another one that's dead. So if we look right here and we look at the span where it hit here and then it drifted through there, then... That would make sense when somebody's taking a spray wand and a sprayer and has it up in the air. The drift comes all the way through here. So, my question is, why would it affect anything way over here when this product is designed to stay in place? Because it wasn't applied properly. And the reason why it wasn't applied properly is because somebody who applied it didn't know what they were doing. And applied it wrong so I've actually seen other beekeepers have problems with uh, city and state or I think it's county uh, spraying the ditches uh, versus mowing the ditches so what they'll do is they'll take a plant killer and they'll spray a weed killer on the like roundup they'll spray it in the dishes ditches versus coming out here and, and running a tractor and mowing it I guess it's more cost effective to buy the chemical and I guess it's cheaper on them to do it uh, since these are tax dollars that are going into this and apparently we have no decision on if a mower goes through here or if a sprayer goes through here. Now, I can honestly tell you this, if I start seeing county come out here with a sprayer, they're not going to like me. Uh, there may be a, a restraining order uh, because of the fact that that's my liveliness right there. And when you start taking food out of my mouth, I start getting mad. Um, you know, if you stop to think about this, you know, there, there's a lot of very honest people in this world. And there's a lot of very dishonest people in this world. And, well, wouldn't you know it, if the dishonest people in this world are the ones that seem to do what they do without any type of, how can I say, smiting. <clears throat> and for some strange reason... When we have natural disasters and things like that, these people just come out of the woodwork. I mean, I've literally seen situations where people put donation pages out during these type of situations. And they're saying, well, we we donating for the kids, we're donating for this. But do you actually know where that money goes? <laughs> you know, I mean, I've actually seen some huge donation pages. And there was one donation page that I was sent uh, via a mail. And they had $150,000 worth of donations. And they said that they were donating to local needy families. Okay. So, that's cool. So, me being who I am, I hopped on my bike and I went to that community to, to go directly to that donation location. And I could not find a physical address. And when I talked to the county seat, the county say, seat said, we're not aware of any donation pages. So, I showed them the link to the donation page. 36 hours later, the donation page was shut down. So there's uh, a lot of interesting thing these days, and it's called free money. And unfortunately, in order to get free money, you have to be able to pay for publicity. So you have to have a business listing in order to do that. And in order to get a business license, you have to pay for it. So here's the interesting thing about donations. Uh, donations are non-traceable, and they're free. 
non-taxable you don't have to pay any taxes on them and if you've ever listened to some of my videos involving uh, the people uh, in this world who uh, want tax free and as well as the people who are constantly evading taxes well these are the same type of people that'll own a business and start up a donation page you know I understand the donation page if it does go to uh, people who actually need it but I've seen some situations where there's some people that have uh, businesses, rental properties, and they're actually requesting donations for their own personal um, griefs. Well, like for instance, there was a situation to where somebody apparently said that they got their truck stolen. So they started a donation page and requested the people, the American people, to pay for his truck. And then later on, a couple of days later just um, miraculously that truck is is found in a local tow yard a recovery location now with my experiences with recovery i was in an accident and i was not able to move my vehicle off the freeway and uh, the very next day when i went out to go recover the vehicle from the freeway the vehicle had been picked up and towed now in this city i've literally seen burnt vehicles on the side of the road set there for weeks if not months but that vehicle had to be removed from the scene i mean literally there was an apartment complex that i lived in that for almost three weeks there was a car that had a whole bunch of colored stickers all over the window um so what didn't make any sense is why is it after my accident my car ended up being towed well the reason why it ended up being towed is because there was value in that vehicle if you'll hold on a minute until the cordwood truck goes by So as I was saying, uh, because of the fact that my vehicle had value, so they saw the value of the vehicle and they, uh, they towed it. But here's the interesting thing. Nobody gave me a phone call and the plates were on my vehicle. Uh, the vehicle was registered in that state. I didn't receive a phone call. I had to hunt the damn thing down. So I know different states are different and other states are different. Um, I contacted the insurance company. The insurance company had no clue where the vehicle had went. And uh, I was actually told by the insurance company, you probably lost your car. And the insurance company said it was totaled. I said, yeah. And I said, so where did it go? And they couldn't tell me. Now, the insurance was liability insurance, so the insurance didn't pay for the damage of the vehicle. The uh, insurance paid for the damages to me. So uh, what I had to do is I had to sit down and I had to call every single tow yard in the metro area to see if somebody had picked up that car. I called one location and the person said no, and then when I called them back, they said yes. And then they said they would give me a call back. Okay, this is how people make money. They see a vehicle on the side of the road, they pick it up, they recover it, they pull a salvage title, but there's a duration of time that they have. Sometimes they say 24 hours. Now, the owner was telling me that I owed a whole bunch of money. I owed this, all these recovery fees, and I kind of looked at that guy and said, you realize I was in an accident? You know what he said? I don't care. It's not my problem. You owe us this much money, and he pointed at the recovery of that vehicle. I said, who gave you permission to recover that vehicle? He said, the city, and said the name of the city. And of course, the scrap yard, and I'm looking at this local yard, and this local yard has what looks like some very expensive vehicles. I was seeing Saabs, BMWs, Jaguars. Most of all the vehicles that I saw that were out in that yard were uh, over $60,000 vehicles. Now, this was in the beginning part of 2000s so I didn't fight with them because I didn't really necessarily have the place to put it because I was under a lease and I basically had two parking spaces and there's no way that it would have allowed me to put a car in that driveway and put a tarp on it or in that parking spot so what I had to do uh, was I had to tell them 
Are you going to charge me for removing my personal items? Yeah, so I hobbled myself out, supporting myself with whatever I could support myself to get into the car. And then when I got into the car, I actually had to take a bit of a break. And, and the person that was standing there actually told me to hurry up and make sure I don't steal anything. And I kind of looked at him and said, uh, do you have the title of this vehicle? He said, it's on the way, but it's on my property. So the entire time that I'm doing this... You know, I've, I've, I'm nursing an injury. Of course, he can't see that injury because I have my shirt on. And I'm, I'm pulling things out. I'm taking things out. And I walk around to the front and I start to take the plates off. And he's like, you don't have our permission to take those plates. And I said, stop me. So then I got into moving around and I went into pulling the head unit out. You don't have our permission to take the stereo out. I said, stop me. So I pulled everything out that was of value. And here, this asshole... I went up to go get my loaner vehicle and bring it down so I can start loading everything up. And he said, you don't get the hell off my property. I'm going to sue you for trespassing. I'm going to call the police. I said, call the police. And he went to go shut the door and I stepped out in front of him and he took off towards the building. So th this was a very interesting thing. And I'm kind of going, this guy is a fucking thief. You know, he's, he's fucking stealing from people. He's recovering vehicles on the side of the road and he's being a complete asshole towards people. So I end up recovering all of my stuff and I, you know, I go back to the apartment and, and, and do what everybody does after you've been in a wreck, recover. You know, I, I still have a bit of a problem with a certain part of my body because of that accident in general. And this goes to say, which is a very interesting thing, because uh, unless the vehicle has been lowjacked, which if the vehicle has been lowjacked, then the vehicle is going to have a key code responder. If there's a key code responder or a key code or any type of device inside that key, that means it's not going to be able to be hotwired. It can't be jump started. You can't steal the vehicle because it has an encoded key code unless somebody has an encoded key code or has a master which that would have to be a dealership or a repo or title and recovery. So here's the interesting thing. Unless it's been lowjacked and unless that information is there, they're not going to be able to connect you with a vehicle. And even if the plates have been removed from the vehicle, they are not going to contact the owner. They are going to use the vehicle for salvage. They're going to keep the money and you're never going to see it again. And like I said, I'm going to repeat this again. Unless the vehicle has been lowjacked, you will not recover that vehicle there are so many vehicles stolen these days and they are stripped down to nothing okay so here's the other interesting thing they're not going to contact you because they're not going to run that VIN number and they're not going to look for the previous owner of the vehicle. Once the vehicle has been recovered they're going to wait a duration of time to see if you're going to contact them. Okay I've gone through this experience in three different states there have been some differentiations of the two. I contacted the local police department. They did not have the information. Nobody knew where it went. So I literally had to call every single tow yard in the metro area in order to recover a vehicle. Now, I understand that this was before lowjacking happened, and I, to my understanding, lowjacking started uh, at a certain year. So, insurance companies have to have GPS location of the vehicle, uh, and as well as during theft, the vehicle can be shut down uh, through other types of uh, programs. You also have GPS. You can actually connect with your vehicle via your cell phone, and the dealership can disable your vehicle at will. Okay, let me repeat that. The insurance company as well as the dealership can disable your vehicle they can also track your vehicle now nowadays there's a lot of insurance companies that actually require low jacks in order for insurance to be placed and like i said depending on the year of the vehicle will be depend on if it's low jacked or not i have an 06 out here and there's a box underneath the dash there's an antenna on the truck and it's an 06 There's also a 2001 in the driveway. It is also low jacked. Now, the interesting thing is, is when you have property and you're in a high crime area, there are GPS devices that you can stick inside your vehicle. So in a type of situation where that happens, 
you can trace it. Now, here's the interesting thing about tow truck companies. Uh, tow truck companies will be called, and they usually don't ask any questions. They'll pick up the vehicle, and they're down the road with it. Uh, there are a lot of dishonest tow truck companies, but there's also a lot of repo companies that are out there as well. So if you do things like park in front of somebody's house and leave the vehicle, or you park it across the street and leave the vehicle, or you park it in an area and you leave the vehicle, if you park it somewhere where it doesn't need to be parked and leave the vehicle, it will be towed. And when it gets towed, it will go to the recovery location, and I can tell you within 24 hours they're going to start pulling parts out of it. As soon as they take the VIN number and they apply for a salvage title or a lost title, uh, more than likely the salvage title uh, is what they're going to be applying for. Now there's, uh, there's uh, how can I say, some people say that's theft, but other people say that's right because of the fact that it's a written law. Now, if you've ever been in the recovery industry and if you've, if you've ever had a vehicle stolen, you'll understand what I'm talking about. You'll file a report, you'll talk to the police, you give the police all the information. But unless, unless somebody reports it or it's seen on the road, there's a possibility and more than likely a 99% possibility that you're never going to recover the vehicle. So then we see a lot of these shysters out here that will do stupid shit and they'll play this little game about things and they'll get their vehicle towed and they'll, they'll lie to the American people. So if you look at a lot of these recovery locations, that's the same thing that they're doing. So if we're going to make this country great again, and if, if we're going to make America happen, um, here, here's the interesting thing. The, the, the type of uh, legal theft that we see here in the United States on a daily basis, and it's not just vehicle towing recovery. It, it's a lot of the people that are abusing the systems, people who have wealth, and they they corner the market on everything. And, they, and what I'm seeing is a lot of these wealthy people are cornering the market on donations. Before you know it, they'll be going to the Salvation Army, and they'll be removing clothing out of the Salvation Army, and they'll be selling them for top dollar designer shit. And with this being said... A little black furry cat that almost lost its tail in the dodge is still alive and for some strange reason she likes it over here so ladies and gentlemen this is about 30 minutes of my voice have an amazing day